you going? Excellent. While America's 700,000 law enforcement officers provide public safety nationwide, it is the more than 2 million security officers employed by public and private agencies that the average citizen will interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. These forces protect such venues as shopping centers, neighborhoods, the workplace, along with more critical assignments such as nuclear power plants and seaports. Demand for increased and specialized protection has resulted in unique private sector solutions such as the CIS Anti-Terrorism Officer Program. Forty specially trained forces will graduate on this program and be sent to protect one of many facilities vulnerable to a terrorist attack on our soil. The threat is ever present and the need is rising for private sector officers who make our nation's infrastructure safer. Critical Intervention Services, better known as CIS, has provided a wide variety of security programs for a diverse number of clients, and their reputation grows with every new assignment. But founder Casey Poulin saw a need for something more. Critical Intervention Services was started in 1992, and uh, the focus was high-end protective services. Uh, we wanted to develop services that were uh, for clients that needed specialized security skills. Initially, it was more towards high crime communities, executive protection, workplace violence, uh, and things of that nature. Post 9-11, of course, uh, evolved a different type of need, uh, which is where we developed the anti-terrorism officer program. Candidates for the ATO program will need a special set of qualities for this assignment. Knowledge of our known enemies and their practices, the art of deterrence, spotting danger in seemingly normal situations, and resolve in the face of terrorism. Take him out. We basically looked for the prior military folks uh, uh, and put them through a battery of testing. Uh, the first cycle of hiring, we processed probably about 750 applicants, and out of that we picked 40. Prior military experience is highly preferred for consideration, and these candidates all have different backgrounds and reasons for joining. The ATO program consists of 11 intense days, beginning with comprehensive classroom instruction and continuing with weapons training and qualification for both handgun and assault rifle, hands-on scenarios, and tactical field training. Combine the candidate's dedication with instruction provided by world-class field experts, and the result is a program with standards unmatched by any other civil readiness training for the War on Terror. Cover, 360 check, and it goes back in. There's an open door there. I want to know what's in that room. Okay. Elite protection requires elite instruction. The training has all been administered by the S2 Safety and Intelligence Institute, uh, the sister company of CIS. The instructors were carefully selected uh, for their backgrounds and unique experience in different areas, ranging from, uh, from tactical response all the way to anti-terrorism and force protection management. When we return, the candidates discover that providing this level of security is much more than shooting a gun. The class assembles for the first time, not knowing what to expect, nor what will be demanded from them. You are setting the standard for everyone else to follow. There is no high-speed deployments like this for any other power company. There is no other high-speed deployments like this for the port, any port. Mr. Gundry begins the day's lessons with a primer on various terrorist factions and how their minds work. Everybody can relate with going to Publix. Everybody can relate with going to shopping mall. But the Palestinian groups caught on to this and started executing attacks in marketplaces and other similar public locations. The discussion then moves into explosive devices and the wide range of methods used by terrorists in executing bomb attacks here in equation form and later via hands-on inspection. He's got the bomb in front of him and he's got to make a decision whether to cut the yellow wire, the red wire. If he cuts the wrong one, the bomb's going to blow up. Okay. In the classroom, they will also learn that one of the primary functions of an ATO is to identify and prevent a possible attack before it occurs. Uh, SATAS is our proprietary system, as you all know, for documenting and cataloging and tracking trends of suspicious activity. Uh, as we all know, the first stages of a terrorist uh, attack 
basically involved information gathering. To support ATO operations, the CIS Information Technology Department developed a special database called SATIS. This database serves as a central repository for intelligence about terrorists and suspicious activity observed by ATOs in the field. The ATO counterintelligence officer uses SATIS to proactively investigate and analyze suspicious events. If terrorists can be detected during the early phases of gathering information, law enforcement agencies can be alerted and additional measures can be taken to prevent the planned attack. But for today, the candidates have gathered about as much information as their minds can retain. Tomorrow it begins all over again. On your feet! Morning, gentlemen. Have a seat. What is unique about suicide attacks versus other forms of attack? High casualty rates. Very high casualty rates. What is the characteristic of terrorism-related risk with regard to probability? Uh, low probability, but high uh, critical. Criticality, absolutely. After a brief review of yesterday's lessons, Mr. Gundry moves on to new topics such as barrier effectiveness and a class favorite, the contamination exercise. We've uh, laced this uh, package with ultraviolet powder. And what we're going to do is pass it around the class, uh, let folks look at it, and uh, we're trying to show them the process of contamination uh, from touching something and how it passes from hand to mouth and to others as you're shaking hands. So as they handle this package, what is going to happen is this box, as it's laced now, the hand will show contamination. If you turn your light back on, you'll, you'll see that it appears that my hand is clean. This visual test proves how easily toxins can be spread. Even the top candidate is caught. It's a light moment in an otherwise serious exercise. From sitting in this class from the time that package was handled, he's touched almost every inch of his face. <laughs> and with the classroom training complete, the candidates head home to study for tomorrow's qualifying exam. This test is a comprehensive examination of the past two grueling days in the classroom. For the candidates, passing this test makes the difference between continuing the program or going home. Well, we tried to construct a, a test that was obviously not easy for anyone that is not familiar with the material to pass. You know, it was, I believe it is a fair test, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, you can tell by the long faces walking out of the room that uh, a lot of the questions do require thought and do require that people have paid close attention. Our goal in constructing this program wasn't to pass ATOs. That's not my job. My job is to make sure that these people know the material they're covering. After the tests have been scored, the instructors have time for some extracurricular questioning. What is the translation for cuando necesita est? When he needs it. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> There are two primary types of weapon systems that the ATOs are using out there in the field within, within the domestic United States, and that's the 9mm handgun and AR. Gordon will be joining the first ATO training class, giving us an inside view of this one-of-a-kind program. A major difference when comparing anti-terrorism officers to normal security guards is that ATOs require a 90% accuracy rating to certify. Standard law enforcement agencies only require 70%. The purpose of this particular shooting drill is for the shooter to shoot the cue out of the target. Tim, the instructor, can do that in two rounds while laying upside down on his back. The recruits, it takes a few more rounds. I didn't get the cue out on the first one, though. It came close. <laughs> I think about five more shots, I would have got it. While this qualification may seem the stuff of action hero movies, the reality is that each shot must be accurate. Every bullet aimed with a purpose, because in the protection of the civilian world, there is no such thing as acceptable losses. Make sure that front sight is right in that center aperture. 
you're almost bottomed out on your front yeah. sight. That yeah, means it's as low as it can go and it's as high as the nose will rise. I'm, I'm aiming the same place every, every time. You can see I got tight groups. Is it head or neck? It's in the neck. He ain't going to be swallowing anything. No, he won't be. Rick, the AR-15, a fairly basic weapon yes, as it is. relates to law enforcement and military. Take us through. All right, basically what we have is a semi-automatic gas-operated weapon system. That means that gas tra channeled through the gas tube operates the mechanism of the gun. All right, we don't require recoil like a, a semi-automatic handgun would. Um, when, we, when we deploy any weapon system, we've got four basic fundamentals that we're looking for for accurate shot placement. Number one is the proper stance, the proper grip on the gun, proper sight alignment and sight picture, and proper trigger control. If any one of those things are wildly out of whack, we're not going to hit the target ideally where we want to. Colin, we're just concerned. We, uh, we overhead some rumors that, uh, that you're blaming some of the results on the weapon itself. Oh, yeah. No, I, I can't shoot at all. And, uh, yeah, it's got to be the weapon system without a doubt, definitely. No such thing. But, uh, <laughs> How are you feeling? You know, you've been grinding it out in the classroom. You first want to finish the, the written examination mm -hmm. after, again, three full days of classroom activity. Now you're out here in the, in the nice, brisk cold working the weapon. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to finally be out and getting some, some of the hands on again. From the AR-15 range, we moved to handgun qualification, where those who didn't bring their best aim were soon taught by the instructor. Although this is your secondary weapon, your primary weapon is going to be slung across your chest. Your AR is going to be the primary gun. If there is a malfunction, a problem, it gets dropped, you automatically go to this. All right? I don't care what gun it is, it's all about side alignment trigger control. I could fire fast or I can fire final. What am I looking for? Fast or finality? I want to end this fight. What happens when I take and all of a sudden pull his gun on this guy and start marching in for him? If he thought he could take me, he wouldn't challenge me unless he thought he could take me. All right? So if he hits me and I go, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please, and I, I become a non-responder, what's he going to do? He's feeding off my fear. He's just going to keep right. coming and keep coming. But if all of a sudden he hits me, and I come back and start going in on him, what happens to his, his mindset? Oh, it. oh wait, you didn't, you didn't lay down and go fetal for me. What's going on? You, were you didn't read the script, all right? What you're going to notice, there are two kinds of wounds that we get. One is soft tissue wound. The other is bone wound. That means the round has struck the bone. Bone wounds hurt. The methods taught here are designed to instruct the class on the most effective ways to disable their target. Skills learned here will soon be second nature to these candidates, with the hopes they'll never need to be used. Now what? That's four inches across, three inches across, three inches down. How many of you feel that's an accurate target that you can deal with if it's moving at you? Not real easy. The body armor drill used to teach two to the chest, one to the head. We don't do that. What we do is what they call Mozambique. We go to two to the chest. If there's body armor, we suspect body armor. We drop down and we start taking the hip joints out. Right. Professor, you've authored more than 43 books <laughs> on security and criminal justice during the course of the past 25 years. As an expert in the field, what do you foresee in the near future? Uh, continuing movement towards privatization. Uh, a continuing uh, a uh, movement uh, from public law enforcement uh, searching out and seeking out private security companies like uh, critical intervention services. After the break, the training intensifies as the candidates begin to realize the importance of their position. This production was designed to familiarize you with the fundamentals of how... The second week begins with hands-on training. Today, the class will be conducting a mock facility search of a room looking for potential explosive devices. Here are your search zones, gentlemen. All right. You will be blue. You will search the blue zone. You will search the yellow zone. And your team is going to search the green zone. Start off with the room indicated as one. And then... now, while you're doing your search, what are you looking for? Don't I'm looking... Stop and just keep talking. 
I'm looking for stuff. I'm looking for stuff that's on waist level or below that is looks like it's out of place, basically. See the wires? Deadly surprises can be found in even the most innocent of items. Here they find a plastic shopping bag hiding a shrapnel bomb rigged with nails. All right, gentlemen, this vehicle has just now stopped at your checkpoint. You are authorized by SFB. The day's activities move outside, where the class is trained to visually inspect vehicles for explosives. Again, in a controlled environment, this exercise seems safe. But within the realm of terrorism, vehicle searches are a dangerous but necessary security measure. Okay, well, one of which is he doesn't have a key to open this thing. Okay, that would be suspicious in the, in, in the real world. Second thing already, did you, uh, when you walked around back by the chance, did you look at that temp tag? And did you look at what's on there already? It's already got a license plate on there, it's not on the back. The ATO candidates move into day nine to conduct two days of tactical training at an undisclosed power plant. While many of the candidates have become very confident by this stage of the program. Oh, yes, sir. Sure I, find I, weapon? I just hope that I don't get shot today. When everybody pulls their D, their G, and their CIS badge up. It only takes one small test to put them in their place before the actual maneuver begins. A simple check of each officer's identification cards reveals some came unprepared. Tolerable today, but never again. Squad leaders, I want you to look down your ranks. The individuals who are sitting down are out of uniform. All right? According to the state of Florida, you will have your D, your G, and your state agency ID on you at all times. Look at how many fines we have here, gentlemen. Wrong answer. If you show up to my training without the proper licensing, what does that tell me? You're going to show up to my job site without proper ID. From the, this point to the end of the training, everything is evaluated. Yeah, Alpha one is what we call personnel gate. In this group will be conducting searches at an entry gate with hostile intruders attempting to breach the facility, while Bravo group practices car exit drills. Always got to do that counter roll. Done. What happened here? This is your kill zone. Get the hell out of it. Okay. Shoot them through the window. That their job can often involve physically challenging situations, as is practiced in this officer down drill. While Alpha Group is at the entry gate and Bravo is rolling out of cars, Charlie Group engages in an exterior search for hiding terrorists. The target acquired. The target in range. The target is neutralized. But in this exercise, targets shoot back. And it shot out at a fairly high speed. And I'm going to tell you what, you take your licks. On the other hand, sat right there. This thing wouldn't throw enough BBs. I saw him, Joe. Battle scars. Good that stuff. Was from the airsoft? That's from the airsoft. Not too soft, huh? No. <laughs> Pretty good stuff. Today's simulated terrorist attack on this unoccupied power plant is the culmination of an entire week of training. After this exercise, the instructors will have a clear evaluation of each individual's ability. As the sun begins to set, the instructors will take their place inside the cavernous power plant, waiting to ambush the ATOs as they conduct their search. For every mode of attack, for every way in which a threat may emerge, there is in fact some type of countermeasure that can prevent that from occurring. But for every protective operation that one can practically put into effect, there will always be some vulnerability that could possibly be exploited. The key to effective planning is being able to find the right balance of being able to estimate 
what the probable methods are that an adversary would use and then design the countermeasures cost effectively to reduce those risks to a level where most adversaries are going to say this is too difficult I'm going to move on elsewhere. The only thing known about this particular exercise is that something's going to happen. What's unknown is whether they're going to respond. The team moves forward. Search. For every mode of attack, for every way in which a threat may emerge, there is in fact some type of countermeasure that can prevent that from occurring. But for every protective operation that one can practically put into effect, there will always be some vulnerability that could possibly be exploited. The key to effective planning is being able to find the right balance of being able to estimate what the probable methods are that an adversary would use and then design the countermeasures cost effectively to reduce those risks to a level where most adversaries are going to say, this is too difficult, I'm going to move on elsewhere. The only thing known about this particular exercise is that something's going to happen. What's unknown is whether they're going to respond. The team moves forward, expecting the unexpected and knowing there's a good reason for it. The interior of this plant is full of hidden chambers, mazes of pipes, and concealed intruders. It's hide-and-seek on a giant movie set with much higher consequences for failure. This is what it takes to get the job done right. And unfortunately, this is something that has been so woefully overlooked throughout the Homeland Security establishment nationwide. You know, is what are the basic requirements for officers, security officers, to effectively prevent and respond to terrorist attacks? And unfortunately, the training standards throughout the nation right now are not designed to address this. Ultimately, our training focuses these officers on, on uh, a number of things. The primary, of course, is deterrence. We want to deter any terrorist uh, from uh, thinking that uh, a target where these officers are deployed at is going to be an easy target for them to uh, attack. So we, we, we train them on, on uh, response techniques, and we train them on the anti-terrorism side on identifying suspicious activity and what to do with it and, and understanding countermeasures to, to, to make sure that um, if a terrorist does look at a target that we're deployed at, uh, he chooses to go somewhere else. Um, but for day-to-day -day operations, we also focus op officers to really understand the interaction between the environment they're going to deploy in and the people within that, that environment, so that the dynamics in play are, are uh, conducive to having day-to-day -day operations with these highly uh, trained and, and highly equipped and armed individuals uh, that these folks have to uh, now live with within a plant. So there's a lot of focus on how, how do you get to know people, how do you open up dialogue and relationships with the folks that are there because they're part of the protection strategy as well. Uh, the more they know us, the more that people can interact with us and give us information. <laughs> Graduation day finally arrives. Those at the top of the class will go on to serve as team leaders at the facility they are assigned to protect. I told you this on day one, I'm telling you this again now. You're protecting my family, and you're protecting each and every one of the family right here that sits at this table. And hundreds of thousands of others, all the way up to the coast of the floor, into other states. What you are doing matters. If you don't perform and something happens, there will be consequences. Congratulations, gentlemen. Dismissed. <laughs>